Hello, everybody. I'm Natalie Brunel. Thank you so much for checking out my show where I get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets, political structures, philosophy, and more. Please make sure you're subscribed to the show. And if you're watching this on YouTube, like this video so more people see it and hit that notifications button so you don't miss out on any new content. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. So make sure you always do your own research before making any financial decisions and be aware of your risk tolerance. I'm able to produce this show thanks to my sponsors, and I'm very picky about who I choose to partner with. So I hope you'll take the time to listen to the ad reads throughout the show. I'm also able to produce this show thanks to the support of my listeners and viewers, Value for Value. So if you'd like to make a donation to help the show grow, you can find my Bitcoin and Lightning wallets in the description. All right, now to my main partner, Swan Bitcoin. Swan is where I do all of my Bitcoin purchases. In fact, I dollar cost average every single day, not every week, not by monthly, every single day. And they have the lowest fees in the space. I love Swan Bitcoin because it is a true Bitcoin only company. Swan has a ton of free educational resources on their website, and they now have a mobile app, which I've been using to smash by some Bitcoin. And Swan Studios produces my new show, Hard Money, which covers the biggest news in Bitcoin and the global economy. It's like an orange-pilled version of CNBC, so make sure to check that out on YouTube for all the biggest headlines, because we are not afraid to question the mainstream narrative. All right, it's time for the show. Super excited for this episode of Coin Stories, where I am joined by Knut Svanholm, who I got to spend some time with in Europe recently. Knut, it's so nice to have you. Oh, thank you, Nat. And uh, nice to see you again. We spent some time in Bulgaria a couple of weeks back. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, maybe we'll talk about one of the debates that we had on the bus. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but I want to hear a little bit about your your backstory, because I know that you you live in Europe, you live in Spain with your family, but you're originally from Sweden. So tell me a little bit about your background. Um, where exactly are you from? Tell us a little bit about your childhood. I grew up on a... Uh, a tiny hill uh, on the south southern side of the biggest lake in Sweden called Lake Vernon uh, on a place uh, on a little hill called Kinnekulle which uh, 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 on the countryside of Sweden so like uh, 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 I grew up next to a um, uh, a lot of barns and uh, <laughs> horses and cows and, and sheep and whatnot so i i grew up on the countryside basically uh, where every bitcoiner now wants to live right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and then we mo we moved into a a small town of about thirty thousand inhabitants uh in my uh high school years so uh or in seventh grade or something 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 like that uh and i spent a couple of uh once half a year and then a couple of months in Africa, uh, once in Mozambique and once in Tanzania growing up, uh, which was very unusual for for uh, for kids at that time and especially from that region. Because my, my father, uh, he worked as a sea captain when I grew up and later on he became uh, the head of a couple of projects in various African countries, wow. uh, building a, a maritime college in, in Mozambique and helping out with some other stuff that I can't remember what it was in Tanzania. And then later when I when I grew up, he worked in, in Nigeria and later on in Bahrain in the uh, Persian Gulf. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so I spent quite a lot of time ab abroad. I had some English cousins, which we visited every now and then. and. Uh, we we drove through Europe at some point as well, uh, but yeah, basically grew up in this little, um, you know, one horse town in Sweden that had uh, uh, a cement factory that my my grandfather on my mother's side used to be the uh, CEO of uh, back in his day, uh, and the rest of the village was like. Uh, workers for the factory this is the the little village where the the school that i was in when when i grew up uh was and wow. yeah and so, i grew up a bit outside of that on a on a farm when you were young what did you aspire to do when you were when you were grown up well <laughs> i wanted to be an 
astronaut and I really? want to be all a superhero and you know all of these uh um I had this period of being very interested in uh, astronomy and dinosaurs as as all you know um curious 10 year olds do my my uh, my own son is in that phase now he he forces me to go out and look at Jupiter and Saturn Aww. like every night so so uh, and uh, yeah I definitely had a period like that uh growing up uh so I guess I wanted to be something along those lines um yeah which which later on made me study you know sciencey stuff uh, <laughs> like math and physics uh, and so on is that what you studied in university math and yeah. physics yeah, I, I studied electronics and uh, engineering for for a year, but I dropped out, dropped out because I was so tired of school and all the bullshit that came along with it. And then I was forced to uh, go out and work on on ships, basically, because my father was a sea captain, so he was the only one that could land me a job somewhere. So I ba basically worked as an AB on a couple of oil tankers and uh my my hobby at the time was sailing old uh wooden ships 100 year old ships wow. so um uh, so so that's what got me into that with with the goal of later on you know getting into the um merchant marine academy in, in sweden uh so you which never I did. worked in engineering you never you never went no down i never path. did no i never went down that path but uh, but I I finished all the math courses and I I got a glimpse of the internet uh, very early on and this was in '96, so the internet had just taken off. Uh, so uh, all the people in that university got to you know a front row seat there <laughs> to, to, what to your, whatever. What, when you were younger, what was your relationship with money? Did you feel like your family was pretty comfortable, and did you did you even you know think about these concepts of of where our money comes from? Uh, that's a good question. I don't I don't believe I ever questioned that until later on in life. Uh, but but uh, I was definitely raised to to you know save for the future and put put money in the bank and let them grow. Uh, th this whole thing of uh, this whole notion of you know uh, mortgage and uh, loans and interest and uh, investing in stocks and bonds and stuff that that hadn't really that wasn't really a thing for the common man in in, in uh, Scandinavia at the time. Uh, it was more like put your money in the bank and they will grow in value over time. And of course, that sounded a little weird to me. I mean, how can that be? How can I? you know, acquire more money from just holding money. But I don't believe those questions ever. I never really thought about money that much until until Bitcoin, really. Mm -hmm. um, that Bitcoin forced me to ask the really hard questions. I guess I, I was interested in, you know, politics and libertarianism and like uh, uh, that kind of stuff before, before uh, ever questioning money. Because money is so basic, so you 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 don't really. It's hard to to awaken that. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, 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 I I think most people don't even realize that they can question money. That's very and true. What it is. Yeah. Uh, and well, and a lot of people don't know about different currencies around the world. And you know, in Sweden, I understand it to be a very wealthy country. So, were yeah. you able to save just by holding the currency in the bank? Well, um, Sweden is wealthy in, in in a sense, but it's also very a, a very socialistic uh, country. Uh, so, and it goes in waves, sort of. Uh, I mean, the the fifty largest companies in the country were all funded founded before nineteen fifties. <laughs> so, so they they were all before social democracy sort of started spending all of that money uh so uh and in a sense today as well it's 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 pretty good for for smaller companies compared to to other countries it uh, you know corporate taxes aren't that high but for an individual uh you know income tax is very high uh that is very high and there's a lot of you know um taxes on alcohol and um you know gas and uh, all sorts of stuff uh, because they want to the politicians really want to steer people into a certain direction 
Right. And it's also a very conformist country where where people uh, tend to agree on most things. It's like Swedes are scared of conflict. So <laughs> there was a British author that uh, wrote about this in a book that I found on the airport once, who said that it's it's not that Swedes don't change their minds. It's the fact that they all do it at, their, at the same time that scares me. And and that's a bit like what it was like growing up in Sweden. Like uh, everyone has the same opinion on every issue until wow. uh, suddenly they don't. This was not your question. I, I got sort of got sidetracked there. But no, it's it is interesting though because I'm going <laughs> to share a little anecdote. I once took a yeah. cooking class in Los Angeles, and there was a small group of people from Sweden. And uh-huh. we just got to talking because it was their first time in Los Angeles and Hollywood. And I think my friends and I, we were asking them what their impression was. Mm-hmm. And they said that what they thought was the most interesting is that they said that in Sweden, you you don't have the same culture to be, you know, um, kind of that, that aspirational culture where you say, wow, no. that person is driving a Lambo. I want to be like them. That's, that's they must have achieved something great. You know, they built something. No. Everyone is kind of expected to have the same. And so they were they were exactly. shocked by some of the the things that they were seeing that represented sort of capitalism or America, yeah. I don't know, kind of American culture. And it was interesting because they said, no, no, no. Like if someone was driving one of those cars in our neighborhood, people would be like, what is this guy doing? Like, why would he no. why would he want that? We're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that- yeah, and the, the, there's the, that can at first glance that can sound like a, a healthy thing that you 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 don't aspire to own a ton of Lambos, but there's a hidden problem with it, and it's like. The whole system is based on envy a lot. We we have something called Jante Lagen, which is like the law of Jante. Uh, this is for all Scandinavia, especially in, in Sweden. That uh, it's the the notion that you're you're not supposed to to think you're special and you, you you're just like everyone else. Uh, uh, and, that does sound like uh, something we need more of. In fact, yeah, it's it's the ethos of Captain America. So you know, I'm just a kid from Brooklyn and all of that when he fights the uh, uh, yeah. the bully. Uh, but so so uh, but that's more on the line. The American attitude to towards it, I think, is more on the lines of anyone can be successful yeah. anyone can become the president and anyone it's equality of opportunity yes. oriented rather than equality of outcome which is the case in sweden you're not supposed to 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 pound your chest and you're not supposed to you know who, who do no you think off. you are yeah. who do you think you are it's like everyone's yeah. asking everyone else that question and it's it's kind of uh i i think it hinders a lot of people from uh from you know daring to take the take uh, certain steps in life i mean everyone sees the the risks in doing something odd or unusual a few people see the risk in in just staying in your hamster's wheel and doing the same fucking thing over and over again every day because that's like that's my my biggest fear is is to have a boring life where nothing happens and mm-hmm. you regret it afterwards like i i can't imagine a worse scenario yeah <laughs> well so um let me ask you i mean did you eventually go to that that uh, merchant school and did mm-hmm. you create a career for yourself within I did being in cat okay <laughs> yeah I did after uh yeah I eventually got into that school and I got my uh master mariner's degree uh which is the degree that precedes your uh captain's license later down the line but in order to acquire the captain's license you need to have you need to do a certain amount of months on a certain um, types of ships like uh, a certain tonnage so the bigger and the further away the ships are the the more the more your experienced your experience is counted as proper shipping experience and so these are the ships <laughs> with the big containers the ones that have any this, any this ship in the world really oh wow you know, like yeah so so there's a, a ladder to climb there if you want to do that if you want to choose that career path and i've had a lot of friends that did and ended up in uh, the big cruise lines and like you know in miami the big disney yeah. cruise ships all of that stuff but but i chose another path and uh, i i didn't want to follow too closely in my dad's footsteps either i had a job offer at, in uh, in dubai to work for 
golf agency company who my father worked for at the time. Uh, but but I said no to that because I wanted to carve my own path and be a self-made man and all of that. So awesome. I uh, so I took a job at the uh, a, a sailing high school on a tall ship instead, uh, which I've told people on many other pods. But the story there is I, w- I worked there with high school students as an officer on that ship for eight years. And that that ship was a bit too small uh, for me to ever climb the certificate ladder. So I stayed an officer for, for a long time. Uh, and when I eventually uh, uh, had kids, uh, I needed to to find something closer to home because I was away for like two months at yeah, a time. Hard. Uh, so I find, found a, a company with smaller ships that uh, took, took uh, uh, they're called crew transfer vessels. So they, they we brought... Uh, technicians and uh, riggers to to wind farms in the north sea and the baltic wow so 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 i i got a job as a captain on one of, uh one of those uh or several several of those and um at some point i met someone from the office uh, and uh i ended up working uh as an hr uh, or a crew coordinator uh, and uh, eventually a crew manager for the whole shipping company so i had like uh, 250 employees on danish and swedish contracts to take care of so i did the whole office career thing there wow <laughs> and, I, and i got almost to the top and i thought like hang on this this career is leading me uh, nowhere too like the i felt the tall ship career was leading me nowhere and this turns out that this office career is also a dead end in the end and like well it will lead to a high paying job for a long time and i can continue with ship in shipping and do whatever but um i felt it was bore too boring for me i, I get tired of things you know because <laughs> because i could foresee what my future would look like yep and this thing called Bitcoin had, uh, you know, popped up from out of nowhere and it started taking over. We're going to take a quick break from the show to hear these messages from my sponsors. First up, I trust capital. Do you save in Bitcoin for your retirement in your IRA? I trust capital allows you to invest in Bitcoin and other digital assets with the tax benefits of an IRA. And unlike the stock market, you can buy and sell 24 hours a day. Instead of paying taxes on Bitcoin gains every year, you can defer taxes using an I trust crypto IRA. Or with an iTrust Capital Roth IRA, you can withdraw tax-free at retirement. iTrust recently hit a milestone of $6 billion in total transactions across the platform, and that's $6 billion in tax-advantaged accounts that those 87,000 new IRS agents can't do anything about. The iTrust Capital platform is easy to use and only takes a few minutes to set up. And if you want to start investing with a $100 bonus, head to itrust.capital slash Natalie Brunel. Next up, let's talk about Bitcoin 2023. That is the biggest Bitcoin conference in the world. And take a look at the video from last year in Miami. It was an incredible event that was jam-packed with the best speaking sessions, workshops, and networking events that I've been to in the space. I had the chance to live anchor the Bitcoin Magazine News Desk and serve as MC. And it was such a full circle moment for me to be at that conference because the first one I attended was Bitcoin 2021 in Miami. Me, and that's where I actually launched the Coin Stories podcast. I went on a media pass because I used to be a reporter and I actually went backstage and started asking the speakers like Michael Saylor and Preston Pish if they would come on my show. And they did. And a year later, I'm back at the conference as someone who actually has a career now in Bitcoin. So you never know what can happen at these events. I highly recommend going so you can meet other people that share the same values and passion for Bitcoin. And if you want your ticket at a 10% discount, head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L. I'll see you there. And this thing called Bitcoin had, uh, you know, popped up from out of nowhere and it started taking over my my um we're, and were I, I couldn't really focus on anything else no were i wasn't living in spain, living in spain. no okay. but, but that came but later we, yeah but we bought the house down here um around that time um so this is a holiday home <laughs> uh 
Uh, and I, I decided three years down the line, uh, after having been in the office for a little more than three years, I decided that, uh, yeah, I'm going to either they're going to have to pay me a lot more than they do now, or I'll just quit and I'll take the car and I'll <laughs> drive down to Spain and just get the hell out of Sweden, which is what I did. <laughs> Wait, so, so for for yeah. people that aren't familiar with your orange pilling story and how you went down the rabbit hole, um, can you share that? Why did you become so passionate about Bitcoin? I think uh, I'm. I get asked that a lot, and I can't really remember a, an exact moment when I got orange pilled. Uh, of course, a lot of Andreas Antonopoulos talks had uh, had a lot to do with my orange pilling. That was because I'm from that generation, like. 14, 15, 16, um, on the run up to the uh, bull market in 2017, basically. And you don't uh, remember if you heard about it from someone that you were working with in the shipping world or someone uh, else? Was I, uh, I was that annoying guy, you know, <laughs> trying okay, to, you were the one. <laughs> yeah, poking everyone about it. Uh, and everyone seems so uninterested. And I'm like, dude, why, why, why aren't you interested? This is like the, the most interesting thing ever and people are like yeah but i don't find interesting things that interesting and like <laughs> so <laughs> but but i did so so i took an online course in in 2016 um uh, the university of nicosia on, on cyprus uh where andreas was one of the teachers uh and uh, the it's called something like uh digital currencies 101 or some or something uh in plural uh but i quite click quickly draw drew the conclusion that that this thing can only like there can only be one of these really because copies of them that doesn't make any sense it's just thin air uh so even the first article i ever wrote about bitcoin was about bitcoin being the the one and only. So I'm very, very glad of that in hindsight. <laughs> Why were you inspired to to start writing? Uh, out of boredom. <laughs> like, that's why I started playing guitar back in the day uh, as well. And and like, so many things come out of boredom. And this was during one of the, um, uh, one of the gigs at, at the, one of the crew transfer vessels. We were in Southern Denmark and out on a wind farm uh and at that time there were maintenance was being done on the turbines so there were uh riggers from the uk and they went out in the morning like there's a 20 minute ride out to the to the wind farm and you drop them off and they climb up the thing uh up the nozzle and then they hang by ropes uh on the the, the whole thing is stopped and they hang from a rope uh down inspecting the wing uh, of the this these things are huge they're like 80 meters high uh <laughs> and of course they need a lot of time to do that so what we did meanwhile was just go to another turbine and more more onto another turbine and just stay there and wait for 10 hours and uh, when we did this on the uh, the windmills that were a bit further off i lost all the internet connections I, or it was too crappy to, for me to do anything <laughs> and uh, there's only one one other guy on board and it's an old danish guy that i had nothing in common with really so and i got bored with all the phone games and i had done all my the things i was supposed to do on board and uh, yeah some uh, and I can't sit still. I can't just do nothing. It never happened. Well, you've been in a bus with me. You know, I need to do something <laughs> all the time. And we're all like that. Too. I love <laughs> we it. were all like that in that bus. But uh, uh, so, so I decided to start. What, what, what can I do that I can do absolutely anywhere? And no, nothing can stop me from doing it. So, well, I can write. So I, I started writing. And... I've always wanted to test my limits, like uh, to to see how far I can take things. Mm -hmm. uh, same with the the tall ship and the the music uh, I did. We, we, like I, I've always been, you know, had this urge to push myself to the limit and see how far I can take something. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what this little <laughs> Bitcoin writing project is. Like it's it's just like uh, 
well, what if I start writing articles about Bitcoin and see what happens? Mm -hmm. Oh, one of them got sort of viral and uh, maybe maybe there's something here. I'll I'll, I'll continue. And uh, all of a sudden I'm like, what 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 what's what's writing a book like? Maybe I can put the articles together into a book. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And then there's like, this is the only book I have to my name now. And it's sort of a lame book because it wasn't really edited or anything. I need to write a proper book about Bitcoin. So yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll write a page a day for a year. And <laughs> so I started doing that. And after 106 days, I, I was sort of done with it. I, I thought, well, I'm going to stop now. I'm going to publish this. This is okay. So, and I did that. And some someone offered to uh, to edit it for me and uh, the product that came out afterwards were way was way better than i ever imagined it could be so i was really proud of it and i'm like uh all right uh no one's giving it <laughs> no one's giving a shit it's just here on amazon and nothing's happening with it what do i do hmm there's a there's a conference in riga here what what if i bring 50 books and give give them out to important people so oh, i did that wow. and then Th more things started happening and uh, so in hindsight i'm very very happy that i uh mustered the courage to do all these things and like uh it's amazing it's really yeah. inspiring and it's uh, a lot of people yeah. have been you know impacted by it and a lot of people have your infinity over 21 <laughs> oh, million yeah. on their on their twitter profile so i want to talk to you about that but first kind this of one. going <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Um, but going backwards just a tiny bit, I feel like everyone's Bitcoin journey is so interesting because you learn about it and you're probably really skeptical, right? There are a lot of people out there right now who, especially if they're turning on mainstream media or listening to anything that you know politicians are saying, they probably feel more scared than ever about entering into this space. What gave you conviction and was it a process of, oh, I'm going to put a little bit, but I'm still learning. Oh, I'm going to put a little bit more. Oh, I, it also grew. So it's now a bigger percentage of my portfolio. Like, can you talk a little bit about sort of your conviction and how it's evolved over the years and where it's at now, given everything that's happening? Yeah, at first it was sort of a novelty and like, hang on, this thing is really interesting. Something on the internet that you can't copy. That's like the opposite of what the computer does. It's what is that? That that's that's an odd thing. What, what do you mean you can't copy it? Like uh, that's the initial like because I'm that's my mathematical curiosity speaking to me. Uh, so so that's the first thing I got interested. In. Not really the money part or anything. Just just the the fact that there was something in computers that you couldn't copy. That was enough to grab my attention. Uh, and then. Then you know you start reading about it, and of course, yeah, when Saifedean entered the scene, that was that was very interesting, and like he added a lot to my my understanding of money and where to look for for books on monetary history and books on praxeology and all that rabbit hole, which is a story in itself, falling down uh, the praxeology rabbit hole. But so I got more and more interested in that and why things are the way they are. Uh, but the thing that really made my conviction about Bitcoin's ironclad uh, was the the Segwit 2x uh, hard fork that that never happened back in 2017. Because that, uh, for those of you, well, long story short, some of you, some of you were there at the time and some were not. But uh, in in short most of the companies in bitcoin uh were in cahoots and uh, try to to change the code yeah. to the miners advantage and the users stop that uh, so this change didn't happen uh, because of game theoretical incentive structures that that uh, like if if that thing would have happened i would have lost all faith faith in bitcoin and i would have sold them all because that would have been proof to me that this thing can't work in the long run because of the precedent it would have set to to increase the block size again. But the opposite okay. thing happened, uh, which really, you might, you know, <laughs> I, I was kind of blown away by that. Like, oh, holy shit, this is this is actually actually no one's in charge. What 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 is this thing like? 
what, what do you mean no one's in charge? That's that's crazy. There's something on the internet that can't be copied and no one's in charge. And it can go on forever because everyone has an incentive to follow these rules. What What is this thing? This is magic. And uh, of course, these, this is why I wrote the books. I couldn't stop thinking about these things and the implications it had. Like, it's huge. It's it's enormous. And it's still like that. Like, I'm walking around seeing normies everywhere do, do, do their little normie things. And I'm like... Guys, why are you still doing all this crap? Don't you know? Have, well, wake up! Like, <laughs> I, I think we all know that feeling. Those of us yeah. in Bitcoin, and honestly, I'm, you know, it's it's so important that you brought that up because for those in the audience who haven't read about the block size wars, whether you, you know, came in a little bit after that. Or maybe you came in in 2017, but didn't take the time to really learn about about the impact of it. Highly, highly recommend studying it a little bit because it is so yeah. important. And um, I mean, what do you think about the current situation now? Because I, I was just talking to some of the people at, at a conference and they said they're worried about miners consolidating, especially the public miners. Nick Carter, I think, gave the the estimate that he believes 25 will turn into 10, which could pose, you know, a risk for <laughs> the decentralization of Bitcoin a little bit. I mean, do you what are you, what's your reaction to everything that's been happening and the downward pressure it puts on Bitcoin, at least right now? And those people that are out there saying, you know, I don't know if I should even get, get into this at this point. Uh, I would say do your homework and and don't trust verify and run your own node and all all that stuff because it's it's not up to the miners and it's certainly not up to Nick Carter uh, what will happen to Bitcoin in the future. His star may or may not continue to rise. Time will tell, but Bitcoin star will continue to rise uh, regardless of what anyone's opinion about it is. Because that's one of the biggest misconceptions uh, about Bitcoin is that miners create new Bitcoin, which is not really true. It's it's the uh, <laughs> the next the next revelation uh, uh, is that oh holy shit the nodes create the bitcoins and they just employ the miners to to uh, create them for them, and it wouldn't work if like so you get that epiphany, but then you think a, a bit further about it and a bit wider and deeper about it and you realize that it's not even the node owners because it's the users if the nodes uh if you're running a node and no one wants your money that's that's not going to work either you know you, you bitcoin needs to be used in order for the people to give enough of a shit to buy a node and run it uh so yeah it's the users and then you realize well who are the users well it's it's everyone even the no coiners, like everyone influences Bitcoin. So it's it's truly there's layer up on layer on uh, of um you know uh who actually is, who's actually in charge of this thing. And all of this centralization FUD, it's it's been going on since day one and it's been disproven already. So uh, and I think the, the like I said, the Segwit 2x hard fork uh, failing was the big tell in uh, 2017 and TikTok next block like <laughs> going that. going I mean um uh, the 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 fact that I've stuck to my guns ever since then and even before then is is like what got me here and not not taking the bag of dollars or other shit coins uh to promote some bullshit project i never did that right. and i'm never going to do that because it's like it's like that quote from scarface where tony montana says all i have is my word and my balls and they don't break for no one and uh, i try to live by that uh and i think that's the Love winner it. that's the winning attitude in the long run we're going to take another quick break to hear these messages from my sponsors first up fold fold is the best bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world you can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase from Amazon to your groceries with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card and win free Satoshis every day or even a whole Bitcoin by spinning the daily wheel and the purchase rewards wheels. 
I actually have an alarm set every single day so that I never miss out on spinning the daily wheel and earning free sats. And, you know, I have to say that Fold is one of the best ways to get someone completely new into Bitcoin because they can start earning it and learning about it and using it. So if you want to sign up and join the fun, head to foldapp.com slash Natalie for 5,000 in free sats. All right, now I want to tell you about a company called CrowdHealth, which is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to health insurance. Because let's be honest, the government and insurance companies have jacked up prices. They've made things super complex. And when you send your money in, it essentially goes into the health insurance black hole, and then you never see it again, even if you don't get sick and you don't need medical services because, you know, you don't eat fiat foods. But then if you actually do get sick or you need care... You have to send them more money because something ends up not being covered. The great news is there's now an alternative brought to you by Bitcoiners, and it is called CrowdHealth. It is very different from insurance. Instead of sending your hard-earned money to an insurance company, you hold your money in an account that CrowdHealth helps you set up. And you can even convert the dollars in your account to Bitcoin. Now, the company is all about community. Remember, it's called crowd health. So when someone in the community is in need, needs care, needs help, you can choose to actually use the money in your account to help them, or you can keep it in your account. And if you ever leave crowd health, you can take the money that's left with you. If you want to learn more and sign up, you can head to joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. Now back to the show. That's the winning attitude in the long run. Uh, I agree. Wait, I have a question. You you mentioned Andreas Antonopoulos before and taking his course. The internet of money is something I think about a lot because it's it's sort of an easy analogy, I think, for people who don't understand Bitcoin yet, this idea that it is a protocol. It's not like these other tokens. And so sometimes I try to make that comparison of, you know, think of in, think of Bitcoin as the internet. And if if you were you know, um, trying to think forward about the birth of the internet and its potential to change our communication and, and our, our, our commerce, our businesses, a lot of people thought it was, you know, going to fail. It was a passing fad. A lot of newspapers out there just said it was going to die in a couple of years and look how it's transformed our lives. But individual companies that created websites, obviously some platforms worked and some of them failed, but it doesn't, it doesn't really, I don't know. It's not a perfect analogy for Bitcoin. Um, but when, when Andreas says internet of money, what does that mean to you? Nowadays in hindsight, I would say it means that Andreas only, only was only able to grok a part of what this thing is and not the, not the big picture, unfortunately, because to, the more I think about it, like Bitcoin is not money, not really. It's, it's way better than that. It's way more than that because it's at the end of the day, it's just ones and zeros. It's just mathematics and a mathematic, uh, a mathematical experience, experiment that we can run in the back of our heads that is so powerful that it, it can influence our behavior in when we interact with one another. And it's so powerful that it illuminates the fact that all, uh, all of human society is man-made and started from an idea somewhere. And it's it's all a competition between ideas and the best idea will win in the long run. And if you compare the idea of central banking, uh, government, democracy, um, <laughs> whatever, borders, uh, hedge funds all all of these concepts that came from somewhere at some point and you compare them to bitcoin and you try to uh, and you you're being honest to yourself so you you um, you 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 ask yourself which which one of these ideas is most rigid and most sound and most undebunkable <laughs> and it's obviously bitcoin because it's based on uh game theory and mathematics and and that's it the the only thing bitcoin needs for it to work is for people to act in their own self-interest mm -hmm. and if they don't they will lose money and they they will shoot themselves in the foot and it, it requires a a tiny little uh amount of belief in the sense that you believe that people will mostly act in their own self-interest but that's all it needs everything else 
can be proven and verified. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it so robust that there's no, to me, that's, that's why I, I don't like the re religious analogies in Bitcoin, because I think it's the absolute opposite of a religion. We're the only ones in the room that aren't religious. We are the only ones actually doing the work and actually verifying and actually proving that something is real rather than just buying into a narrative and buying a story which when, is required for all other in, you know institutional money and everything else in society really but when, bitcoin is not like that yeah when <laughs> normies ask you the difference like why you know why do all of us say bitcoin not crypto or that there's a big difference how do you explain the difference to them um yeah i've i've tried to do that uh, many times and like the the my <laughs> Uh, ironically, my my most famous quote is probably from my uh, least famous book, which is the second book called I Independence Reimagined. And there, in there, is something I call the one shot principle, where I where I tried to frame this in uh, as few sentences as possible. Uh, and the way I put it was uh, uh, the one shot principle: absolute mathematical scarcity. Uh, achieved by consensus in a sufficiently decentralized distributed network was a discovery rather than an invention. It cannot be discovered again by people aware of this discovery, since the very thing discovered was resistance to replicability itself. So you can't re you can't replicate resistance to replicability. That's the, that's the the gist of it, uh, and like. <laughs> Uh, my latest version of that is that the, the you can't double solve the double spending problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I've re later been corrected on that uh, by, by some very clever people that the, the double spending problem actually existed in computer networks before Bitcoin. But in the uh, speaking about money, uh, the double spending problem could only be couldn't be double solved. It could only be solved once. Because double double solving it is double spending it. Mm. So yeah, using any any other crypto or any other currency for that matter is uh, is uh, you know inflating the money supply. You're using something that can be inflated, and like if we're not sticking to one set of rules, we are per definition diluting the supply. Yeah. When you first thought of you know infinity over twenty one million were you thinking of it in the context of just the fact that Bitcoin number can go up and up until infinity or the fact that there is infinite potential to sort of rebuild an economy and create value in lots of different places in a borderless way that's absolutely secure? Or, you know, when you were first thinking about that, where did it really come from? What what were you wanting to kind of um, emphasize about Bitcoin? Uh, the phrase everything divided by 21 million or mm -hmm. imagine everything divided by 21 million is from an article called Deeper Down the Rabbit Hole, which was published in Citadel 21 magazine. On the uh, 21st. right? On the 21st of August, mm -hmm. <laughs> which later became the Bitcoin Infinity Day uh, yeah. by pure luck uh, in 2020. And I remember writing it. I was pretty tired at the time and fell asleep right after I, uh, I, I wrote the article. And I thought a while about it, like, am I going to send this or am I going to have someone else have a look at it or maybe have a look at it a couple of days later? Ah, I'll, I'll just send it to hold them out. It's good enough. So I sent it and didn't think much about it until I heard guys one read it on, on Bitcoin Audible. Uh, when I was walking home from a, a Bitcoiner steak dinner in, in Copenhagen or walking to my hotel. Uh, and that's when I, I realized, like, holy shit, this is probably the best thing I ever wrote. I should do something more with this. And I contacted Yoni Appleberg, uh, who um, animated the thing and designed this beautiful equation. And the the rest is history. And it just took off. That, that, that video was very popular among Bitcoiners and especially the the equation that came out of it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have experienced that thing. It's it's weird. <laughs> what do you think will be that next catalyst for a bull run? I mean, we're a year 
about a year and a couple months away from the next halving, but we're, it looks like about to fall off the cliff with the price even more. And it seems like people are doubting the whole space because of what crypto has done to the name of Bitcoin yeah. on a macro level. Obviously the tightening is continuing because they want to try to fix the inflation that they created that they want to deny. Um, so what do you think, it, it, what is it going to take for that next bull run and the next adoption wave to happen? Uh, well, it's going to take people like you and me doing what we do and uh, continuing to to relentlessly educate people about this instead of and not listening to naysayers and and fudsters because we've done our homework and we know we're right. So so we're uh, that's what it takes. It takes bit, bitcoiners orange pilling other bitcoiners. <laughs> uh because once once you've taken the orange pill the and and you you truly realize what what this thing implies you don't want to do anything else with your life it's it becomes your uh what's that word uh, volition uh your your passion well, what what uh, vocation? vocation vocation is the word i'm yeah. i'm i'm looking for uh it becomes yeah uh, what you want to do with for your sure. life at, at a certain point um for for a great many reasons uh mm -hmm. and uh, i guess it's uh, it's going to be hard work but it takes people bitcoiners orange peeling other bitcoins when you when you or when you help other bitcoiners you help bitcoin and when you when you help bitcoin you help other bitcoiners so yes. some it's it's uh we're all incentivized to do do so anyway so so why not like take that to heart and just go out there and do what you can do you think that there's any legitimate threat to bitcoin uh i think the biggest threat yet was ethereum and when i look at that uh it, it's it's hard to take it seriously because it's such a <laughs> such a lame threat <laughs> like really <laughs> You're really gonna think that people are gonna fall for that? Those unicorns and dancing people, like uh, that being an actual alternative to this? Then no, no, I don't think so. But yeah, I mean, not to Bitcoin itself, the protocol. I don't, I don't see a very, uh, I don't see a threat to it because it's it it helps everyone. A anyone who understands it. You know, in order to threaten it, you you must understand it first to attack mm -hmm. it at all. And once you understand it, you're not incentivized to threaten it. True. You you, <laughs> but the opposite happens. So, uh, so I'm not not at all worried there. I I'm I am worried for, you know, people being fooled by scammers again, over and over again, and that this this uh, scammer market cycle will keep on repeating itself it happened in 2014 it happened in 2018 it happens now mm -hmm. uh and it's the same thing over and over again it's a, a shit coin or purge like <laughs> you get rid of the bad seeds that's uh, but but there are still very many bad seeds left there are still altcoins or shit coins out there uh, i mean coinbase is still up and running <laughs> uh, binance is still up and running all of these shitcoin casinos are still there and they will all fall at one point. Uh, central banks are still a thing. I mean, we're going to see a lot of pain before hyper-Bitcoinization, but I'm not worried for Bitcoin itself. I'm, I'm worried for the people that are yet to, to figure out what this thing means. Mm -hmm. Well, just as we start to wrap up, when you talk about that idea of central banks still exist, the altcoin casinos are still there. What do you think the transition will be like to a Bitcoin standard? Because um, it sounds like you believe that in the future, Bitcoin will uh, achieve the destiny that we sort of all, all want it to achieve. So what does that transition look like? Because to some, I feel like it might, it might, sound like revolution potential violence you know a total shift yeah. a paradigm shift once in a lifetime that moves us to some new monetary system and on the other side maybe there's hope and abundance but to get there there's going to be a lot of pushback from the powers that be that don't want to release their grip on power 
Yeah, but I think this is this is where I uh, uh, disagree with most other Bitcoiners because most Bitcoiners say that they prefer a slow transition to a fast one because there will be less violence. But I don't believe that is the case because Bitcoin removes violence, the profitability motive from violence at, at all levels of society at all times. So the faster we can go through that process, the less violent it will be. What people tend to forget is that what we're living in now is violent. Uh, you're you're being threatened, and you're forced to give up the fruits of your label uh, labor to to a third party without your consent every single day of your life because you're forced to use these fake fiat fucking currencies that we all hate, and you're, most of us are also forced to pay a lot of taxes. Uh, which is pretty ridiculous, considering that the people wanting you to pay those taxes have a fucking money printer. So why are there taxes at all? And all of these questions that show up in your head when you start to realize, sorry for swearing so much, Natalie, it's not my fault. I get <laughs> no, upset. <laughs> uh, but but uh, uh, so we're in a violent situation now. Most people don't realize that they're they're being forced into slavery every day partial slavery uh it's a if you if you pay if you pay 50 percent of whatever uh you earn in uh taxes and inflation you're 50 percent a slave there's no way to get around that like uh, the definition of a slave is someone that is not allowed to uh, uh, to decide for themselves what to do with their time uh, uh and if you pay 50% tax, you, you uh, half of your working life is being taken away from you. So, so uh, yeah. So, and that's the reality we live in. So the faster we can go to a Bitcoin standard where that can't happen, uh, we can just interact voluntarily and consensually with one another, mm -hmm. the better. And I think there's so much that will be better on the other side. Um uh, Especially the uh, the fact that we won't even crave that much stuff once we're on a Bitcoin standard, but we can get we can get into that very rabbit hole at another time. Maybe. <laughs> well, <laughs> will we all be more Swedish? Will we all uh, have more of the same? Do you think that it will be more equal? Um, I definitely believe it'll be more equal opportunity, but the world will always be unequal in outcome because some people want to work harder, some people want to yeah. work less hard, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and I, I, the, what Bitcoin brings is uh, equality of opportunity. I just think that people will crave, will not crave as much stuff as they used to, but because inevitably Bitcoin leads you to become a more stoic person, and uh, you, you're you're sort of forced to to ask these deep philosophical questions about what. What you want with life because you can at, at all times you can choose to spend your bitcoin on some shit you don't need or to mm -hmm. keep them and watch them grow in value over time mm -hmm. and for most people the, the the longer they're in bitcoin the more they realize that oh shit i shouldn't have bought that iphone for bitcoin i shouldn't have done that with my bitcoin i should just have right. you know so 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 we're incentivized to not over consume uh we're incentivized to uh and we're also incentivized to just be good to one another because we're like the thing that you and I are doing right now, where we both uh, feel that this is bringing some value to our lives to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And we're not exchanging any Satoshis with other with each other. So I, I'm not paying you to do this. You're not paying me to do this. We're just incentivized to uh, engage in a what we feel will be an interesting conversation anyway. Because we we like interacting with other Bitcoiners, we think right. it's valuable. Mm -hmm. So so we're incentivized to help one another, and I, I all of that will still be there on a in a hyper Bitcoinized world. There there's there's no there's nothing stopping us from becoming better people once we're on that that standard. And yeah, that's the latest thing I that I can't get out of my head how much more beautiful the hyper Bitcoinized world can really be because it's really mind blowing. I love that. And it makes me think of what Saifedean wrote about in terms of low time preference and really thinking about the future and 
right now, I feel like what we were talking about earlier, even people do kind of maybe purchase those material things because A, it's a symbol of the fiat world and fiat success, yeah. but also because it it's the dollars are going to be worth less in, in a few years. So you want to buy things now and consume, consume, consume. Yeah, and yeah. we're allowed to all just go into debt so you can buy things you can't even afford. So, yeah. 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 So hopefully Bitcoin reforms a lot of that. Um, Where I want to close up is, you know, the fact that you just said you've got this stuff on your mind. What's the next thing that we're going to maybe see from you? What are you writing and what do you really want to tackle in this space? Well, I spent a lot of time, you know, uh, d- doing conferences and then with the Free Madeira project l- lately. So we're trying to get that to to become uh, become a thing uh, even more than than it is right now. So we're, we're uh, I was on Madeira till two weeks ago. Uh, after all the conferences, I spent three weeks there, and uh, a lot of things are happening. Um, you can go to freemadeira.com to learn more about that project. Uh, we're trying to make a Bitcoin beach in the EU, basically. So. Uh, uh, so that has taken up a lot of my time. Uh, I'm working on a new video with Yoni Appleberg. Uh, and I'm also trying to write some fiction, which is way harder than I thought. <laughs> Ooh, there uh, should be there should be some Bitcoin fan fiction. <gasps> yeah, there's a, a book project uh, coming. I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about it, but uh, there will be 21 stories from 21 different writers. I love uh, it. Uh, uh, at some point. Um and there's a bunch of projects like that. I'm uh, trying to figure out how to ship the the wine that will be done in a couple of months to mm. whoever ordered it from whatever country. And yeah, so I'm doing, I'm throwing things at the walls to see what sticks. Uh, and uh, yeah, who knows when I will write something longer next time. Uh, I have nothing planned, but I'm sure inspiration will come at some point. I bought a guitar the other day, or two guitars. So I've been playing a lot lately. My brother is down here; at the, uh, it's been here for for uh, almost two weeks now, and we've been playing a lot. So yeah, and that was fun. So a lot of stuff. I love it. You and uh, we got to get you and Jeff Booth in a room playing together. Maybe we can make a song from uh, "Everything Divided by Twenty One Million. That could be. <laughs> We got to think yeah. of some lyrics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We played together down here. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, Knut, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. And uh, I really appreciate it. And it was so much fun hanging out with you in Europe. Yeah, likewise. Th- thanks a lot, Natalie. <laughs> Thank you so much for checking out this show. Again, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any new content. And I love to hear your feedback. Leave a comment or send me an email at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Let me know what you think, if you have guest suggestions, and I'll see you next time.